Welcome everyone. We are going to get started with our webinar in just a minute. Um, this is Lynette Kraft, the Chief Science Officer at ACSM. Again, we'll get started in just a minute. All right, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to ACSM's Professional Development Webinar Series. Today's webinar will be on negotiating a startup package. Before we get started, we have a few housekeeping, th housekeeping things I'd like to go over. First, if you have a question during the webinar, please type it into the question area on your screen, and we'll try to get to as many as, of these as we can at the end of the presentation. I'd also like to thank today's sponsor, Forrest T. Jones. If you're an ACSM member, you qualify for exclusive member discounts through Forest T. Jones. Be sure to check out the ACSM website member benefits page for more information on that. Finally, if you'd like to join the conversation about today's webinar on Twitter, we encourage you to do so by using the hashtag ACSM webinar. Sometimes people tend to have, uh, can have difficulty with audio on the webinar. I wanted to let you know that this is a voice over IP webinar, meaning it's totally web-based. There is no call in number. So if you experience audio difficulties or if the video begins to buffer, it's likely caused by the strength of your internet signal. So try logging out and logging back in. All right, to today's presenters, I'd like to introduce you to the two speakers we have today, Dr. Wojtek Hajko Zyko and Dr. Mark Bleggen. Wojtek is the Dean of the Graduate College at the University of Illinois at Urbana Champaign. Currently is also serving as the interim dean of the College of Media. Prior to assuming his current position, Dr. Hodgko Zyko served for many years as the head of the Department of Kinesiology and Community Health at the University of Illinois. Dr. Blagan is the Dean of Health Sciences at St. Catherine University. Prior to his appointment, he served as an associate dean and department chair for nutrition and exercise sciences. We're really excited to have these two as our presenters today. Between the two, they have ample experience as both department chairs and deans and have, as such, negotiated many startup packages over the years. So at this point, we'll turn it over to them. Again, if you have questions, type them into the question area and we will get your questions at the end. Very well, thank you everybody. Thanks for joining us. Um, uh, I'm gonna divide the comments with Mark uh, over the next uh, 20 to 30 minutes or so. Um, if you could advance the slide, Lynette. So I wanted to briefly uh, go over the learning objectives. I think that you're gonna hear from both of us that there are a number of factors that influence what kind of startup you could expect to receive. Uh, the first and most important one is probably the type of institution. Um, uh, is it a research-focused institution? Is it graduate or undergraduate? What is the uh, teaching load and expectations? Those are important to know. Secondly, uh, there are large variations with respect to startup packages for different types of uh, teaching uh, ex uh, professorships. So, for example, if you are in an area of research that has large lab and equipment needs, the startup package is likely to be different um, than it is if you're working in an area where maybe your primary uh, resource is a good library or uh, doing some uh, anthropological or interview uh, needs. And then, thirdly, I think it's really important to think through um, what are the uh, expectations at your institution, what are kind of resources do they have, and um, what would be a reasonable request given your job. So I'm going to pass it on to Mark for the next slide to give you a little bit, a little bit of an outline of what we're going to be talking about. Yeah, thanks, Wojtek. Following up on that, this is what we're going to talk about today, some important things. And as Wojtek had mentioned, the type of institution. Um, Wojtek is at a large Research One institution. I'm at a small private liberal arts institution. And as such, there's going to be different startup packages available. Um, uh, again, referring to the previous slide, what's the nature of the department and of the position? There's going to be different expectations uh, depending on where you land. 
there'll be a, a balance of research and scholarship. And if you come to a smaller private liberal arts institution, a huge component of your uh, work will be teaching as well. And so how do you navigate that in your startup? And then the last couple, uh, just talking about what is a reasonable request. Uh, it's always a little bit uh, intimidating, especially when you go into your first position. Uh, what is a reasonable request and, and what should you ask for? And so we'll cover that as well. And then we'll end with some additional readings. So thank you and we can advance the slides. So, you know, at a research one university, there is a significant expectation that faculty will be uh, producing publishable research and oftentimes securing externally funded grants to provide resources and support for that research. Now, for that reason, at an institution like the University of Illinois, many faculty will have a 2-1 or possibly a 2-2 teaching load with at about 40% of their time dedicated to research. In institutions like mine, because faculty are expected to earn grants and to publish extensively and to develop clearly defined research agendas, we feel an obligation to provide faculty with the kinds of resources that they need to be successful. Um, Mark, tell us a little bit about how it goes at your institution. Yeah, you know, a little bit at the other end of the spectrum. Uh, at most small private liberal or private institutions, a significant a significant portion of your time and energy will be spent teaching in the classroom. And so it's not unusual that uh, a, a typical load uh, for a faculty member at our institution is six courses per year, three per semester. So much like Boytech said, well, 40% of your time at a large research institution might be dedicated to research. It could be that 60% of your time at an institution such as this is dedicated to teaching. Uh, but there is an expectation of scholarship and research as well typically don't have the resources that some of the larger institutions have. But again, depending on the type of institution, which institution you're at, a, a startup package can be negotiated so that you can put forward a research agenda and work towards promotion, tenure, scholarship, and things of that nature. Very good. Next slide, please, Lynette. <clears throat> so, you know, even though we just talked to you about differences across the institution as a whole. There are also big, big differences between departments at the same institution and oftentimes between faculty members in the same department. So um, at the University of Illinois, in the kinesiology and community health department, for some faculty members, a startup package may have been uh, in the region of $50,000, which would be some money to support uh, uh, funding a research assistant for a year or two, uh, some money for computers and equipment in the lab, in, in the faculty member's laboratory. But for other positions, perhaps a, a physiologist or a biochemist, the startup package might be much greater if they had the need for a particularly sophisticated piece of equipment. Um, it wasn't unusual for us to agree to startup packages of three or four hundred thousand dollars. And in engineering at my university, startup packages seldom are less than a million dollars, a million dollars for a faculty member. But what's important to recognize is that the startup package isn't just pulled out of the air by a department head or a dean. It's tied to what you need to do in order to meet the job description that you're applying for and in order to be successful. So if I had a faculty member who was perhaps interested in uh, sport history, I wouldn't be considering a six-figure startup package, but I would be asking that faculty member to tell me what is it that you've done in the past, what is it that you want to continue to do in the future, and 
how can the department help you be successful and to do all of that in the context of what we've done in the past for other faculty members so that whatever the request was would be uh, in line with what we had done previously. So, so Mark, tell us how you negotiate different sort of levels of startup package. Yeah, uh, a little bit different than what Voitech says for the large R1 institutions where at, at a school like St. Kate's, there's not gonna be as broad or as wide a range of differences across the university, whether you're in our biology department or in our nutrition exercise science department. But I think Voitech brings up an excellent point. As you look at the job description, what do you need to be successful and what do you need to accomplish? And I'd be completely honest with you and say, the largest startup package that I've been a part of at this institution is a little less than $100,000. So you're not going to see the million dollar, the multi-million dollar startup packages here. What's, what's done much more frequently is we talk about negotiating time. And so if you're coming out of a graduate school or you're looking at a school like St. Kate's, which is primarily a teaching institution, we can negotiate time in terms of rather than teaching six courses your first year or your first three years, we can say we're going to give you a reduced teaching load so that you have the time to do the work that you need. You have the time to become used to the institution and work on your teaching. More often than not, the startup packages that we negotiate deal with time and then also certain types of equipment. So if there's a specific piece of equipment that you need to get your research done that we don't currently have at the institution, we negotiate for that as well. Uh, but definitely on the other end of the financial spectrum than the large R1 institutions. So actually Mark and I were at Kent State University at about the same time uh, in the exercise science program there. I was a faculty member, he was a student. And sort of at Kent State may be halfway between our two institutions right now in that there wasn't an expectation that every faculty member would have their own individual laboratory. And there was a lot of sharing of laboratory space and equipment. And so I think it's very important for you to know what the culture is at the institution you're negotiating a job. If they have a culture of shared equipment, you're gonna to need to know, do they have what it is that you think you need to do to uh, do your scholarship? Uh, it, if, will you have access to it? If you are planning to do some specific studies, are you gonna be impeded because they only have one uh, a respiratory gas and a analysis system? Um, those are the things I think you need to think about and as you negotiate with the department head or with the dean, you need to be able to couch your request in the context of what you are planning to do in the future. And I think if we go to the next slide, we'll develop that a little bit more. So, um, Mark, would you like to take the lead on this? Sure. <laughs> Much like Voitech said, as you look at, if you're coming out of graduate school or if you've been in another institution, you want the request, like the slide says, to be linked to both your prior research and teaching experience and what you're gonna do in the future, because hopefully everyone's planning for growth. And that comes down to equipment, what's already available. And I think, you know, Voitech addressed this a little bit on the earlier slide, but if you're at the point where you are negotiating a startup package, you've been offered the job and you've had the opportunity to be on campus, interact with the department and maybe depending on the size of the institution campus-wide interactions. So you'll have a sense of the collegiality uh, and the relationships that exist there. And so you really need to think about that. And, and I really like that word culture. What's the culture of the program? What's the culture of the university? And that's a lot easier to assess at an institution like St. Kate's than it is a larger institution. But here at St. Kate's, we have a very collegial um, relationship with our colleagues in biology, nutrition, exercise, science across the campus. And you can get a sense for that. And a word that you will hear quite often on an institution, at an institution such as St. Kate's, is interdisciplinary and interprofessional. Uh, there are, I can't think of any one faculty member at St. Kate's, and we're a school of about 5,000 undergraduate and graduate programs that has their own individual lab 
all of the labs on campus are interdisciplinary. Our human performance lab here at St. Kate's has a couple of biology professors, a couple of physical therapists, exercise physiologists, all using that same space. And so if you can get a sense of that culture, can you share equipment? And then think about what you need in the future. What, what don't we have? What do you need? What do you need in your teaching? Uh, you can include that in your request. Yeah, but you know, one of the things I would add is that if you have significant teaching responsibilities, if you utilize eye clickers or other kind of pedagogical equipment, you should be asking about the availability of that kind of equipment just as much as you do about any equipment that you use in your research. So that's again, part of an understanding of how you can bring success, not only to your own career, but to the department that's hiring you. And, you know, I, I was a department head for 15 years and negotiated many, many, many different uh, startups. And I was always hugely impressed with the candidate who bought for me a two or three page description of the various studies that they plan to do over the next two years. Um, at an institution like mine, it, it was really good if they could tell me what NIH call for proposals they were uh, focusing on or what NSF grant or a DOD grant, but to show me that they had thought through what it is that they wanted to do, that they could explain to me how that built upon their previous publications, their previous expertise, and then tie whatever equipment request they had into that agenda. So for me, the candidate that came in well prepared and who appeared to have thought all those things through, to me, seemed to be the one that would be more likely to be successful. So, you know, I get it that you're negotiating a startup when you've been offered the job, but very often having a really clear idea of what you need is going to help you to be the individual selected as the uh, choice for the job as well. And so I think that's really important. Yeah. And I think along those lines, uh, to that, to Voitech's point, negotiating your startup package begins with your first letter when you apply for the job, right? So that interview, it's part of the interview, it's continuing, right? So if you can show that preparation, can't speak enough about that preparation, whether it's your letter, that's going to put you on good foot footing when the time when the time comes to nail down your startup package. Very good. Next slide, please. So, what's a reasonable request? I, I have been astonished at the number of people who've interviewed for a job with me who didn't seem to know anything about the department or the institution. Basically, they hadn't done their homework. They would say stuff like, well, I'm not sure what kind of laboratories you have in the department. Well, you know, we have loads of web pages for every single laboratory we had in the department. And uh, you didn't have to be a, a rocket scientist to look that stuff up and to get a good sense of that. And so I would urge every single candidate, first of all, to visit every page on a department's website, to take a look at what other faculty members have done, what their expectations are, what grants they're getting, what they're teaching, and really know that stuff because it's going to help you to figure out what is a reasonable request. Secondly, ask people about that. There's no reason at all why you can't call somebody you met on in an interview and say, you know, I'm really excited about the position, I'm thinking about it, but I'm not sure what would be reasonable for a startup request. And I think you're going to find that members of the faculty or even the department head are really pleased to help you with that. So, don't be shy. Um, I always appreciated when I got an 
itemized list of everything that a candidate wanted me to get. And the bottom line might be some outrageous figure, but I would then always take it to the director of that particular area. It might be exercise science, it might be exercise psychology, and I'd say, could you take a look at this request and tell me, is it reasonable? Tell me what we already have. And then I, my colleagues would come back to me and say, you know, I think this, this, this is reasonable. Don't need this stuff right now. And then I would be able to come back with a counter offer. But if a candidate comes to an interview and doesn't have any idea of what their startup equipment needs or how much time they need uh, released or summer support time or time for GAs or RAs, then my sense was, am I sure they're ready for a tenure track position? So my, my advice to all of you would be to super over prepare, both at the interview stage and also at the negotiation stage. And certainly don't just settle for whatever the, the first conversation you have with a department head or a dean. Ask for some time to think about it, call some friends, call people at the institution and negotiate around a reasonable request. Mark. Yeah, and just, to, just to reiterate that, right? Uh, do your homework, it is always impressive as a dean when someone comes in prepared. And that says a lot about that individual. So do your homework. It's kind of like uh, the old saying that when you're, when you're being interviewed and you're asked, do you have any questions? And I'm, I've always been surprised when there's people that say, no, I don't have any further questions, right? That's a red flag to me. And so do your homework. Don't be shy, much like Wojtek just said, ask the question. It's always impressive to me when people come with a list of questions and a list of requests. And you know, this is an ACSM webinar and I'm trying to do some math in my head. I think I went to my first ACSM meeting in 1994 and I have yet to meet someone through the ACSM or in the fields that we're in that has shut down a question that I've asked, whether it was as a graduate student, as a fat young faculty member, uh, people in our field, people in the ACSM are incredibly open. They're honest, they're here to support you and mentor you. So don't be shy, ask those questions. You can learn so much. Uh, so just, just reiterating what Wojtek, what Wojtek shared. Okay, next slide, please. You know, you know, with the beauty of Google searching nowadays, you can easily find additional material to take a look at. And I put up a few links here that you'll be able to follow up if you want to. But actually, my advice is to go to the professional association of the area of exercise science that you're in, whatever it is. You know, if you're a, a physiologist, a sport and society person, an exercise psychologist, and take a look through some of their professional groups about professional expectations, what's needed for a startup, but there's no shortage of information out there about negotiating jobs, thinking through what to um, include in a startup request. And, you know, I, I'll tell you that I've been a faculty member at many different types of institutions, and I've always enjoyed being on either side of the negotiation process. It's an exciting time. You're gonna get a new job or you're gonna hire a new colleague. So um, I wish you well and I'll hand you over to Mark. Yeah, and I would say the exact same thing. Uh, rely on those people that helped get you to where you are, develop and nurture those relationships. And again, don't be shy. Don't, uh, don't not ask the questions because you can learn so much by asking questions and all of us are gonna be receptive to them. We'll hand it over to Lynette to tell us if there are any questions. Great, thank you so much. That was incredibly interesting and, and your insights were so helpful. Um, we do have time for just a couple of questions. Um, the first one comes from Sarah. It says, um, what are things that we should be considering other than salary and lab space or equipment? You had mentioned things like teaching load, uh, graduate students travel. Are there things that people tend to forget about 
that they should be asking about when they're negotiating a startup package? Well, I can think of several. I can think of work-life balance issues. So, um, you know, I have four young children and uh, I'm fortunate, I'm a dean and I'm well advanced in my career. But oftentimes, if you are an assistant professor and you're thinking about things like starting a family, you want to know what are the family leave arrangements? What would happen if I wanted to start a family? So those questions are absolutely legitimate questions. For many of you, you'll have a partner and you might be thinking about choosing an institution uh, where your partner could get a job too. So asking questions about dual career plans. Is there any assistance from the university or the department to try to help you uh, find a career for your significant other? Those things are important. And then many positions are nine month positions and you can ask questions about whether there's an opportunity for teaching or for supporting research in the summer and how that works at, at your institution. Mark. And I would add to that, you know, it was briefly mentioned, but travel, right? How much at St. Kate's, there's a, there's a certain allocated amount so you can negotiate for more travel because conferences become expensive. And the other big one I would think uh, that you'd want to negotiate for are relocation packages. Uh, it's not cheap to move. And so can you build that into your startup package where they'll pay for a certain percentage or up to a certain amount of your moving expenses? Because that can be a big one-time expense that you can negotiate for. Lynette? Right. Yes, we have another question that's come in. Um, this question is addressed to each of you. Is there anything you would have done differently regarding your own startup package negotiation? Mark. I would, I would have asked more questions and I would have asked for more. Right. Knowing what I know now, I wouldn't. Have, the things we just talked about, I wouldn't have been as shy. I wouldn't have thought they're going to think I'm asking for too much. Go ahead and ask the questions. Uh, don't be shy. It's those things we talked about, and I wish that I wouldn't have been as shy. You know, from my point of view, I interviewed for jobs at the University of Alabama, at uh, Kent State, and at the University of Illinois. In each case, I think I really prepared well. I went in knowing everything there was to know about the department or the college I was moving into. So I was pretty pleased about that. I was never a hard-nosed negotiator. So I would not demand this, this, and this equipment. And maybe I could have gotten a little bit more if I had been a tougher negotiator, but you've always got to find the right balance between um, being keen to be a team player and being perceived of as trying to get as much as you can for yourself. Overall, I think I am satisfied with the way things worked out. I got what I needed to do to advance my career, or what I needed to have to advance my career at that particular point in time. All right, great. It looks like we have time for one more question. So we'll finish uh, up with this question. What are the most common mistakes that people make when they negotiate a startup package? They say yes too quick and they underprepare. Mark. Ditto. <laughs> Boy, Tech said it perfectly and succinctly. Yeah, and you know, I've noticed a gender issue here sometimes that oftentimes for cultural reasons, I found that some uh, female candidates seem to be a less hard-nosed about negotiation. And I, I strongly encourage people to, to try to disconnect from any kind of a, a cultural perspective. I think that's changing over time. And I think that now uh, students coming out of graduate school are, are tougher and uh, stronger negotiators. Um, but, you know, there was one time where a person came in with a startup request for about $20,000 worth of stuff at Illinois. And I said, no, 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 
that's too little. Go away, think about that some more, call some of these people on the faculty and revise your request. And so remember that the institution that's hiring you wants you to succeed too. And uh, both of us are investing, not just in your future, but also in the future of our departments and our institutions. All right, thank you so much to Dr. Hodgko Zyko and Dr. Blagan. On behalf, on behalf of ACSM and our sponsor, Forrest T. Jones, we want to thank all of you for attending today's webinar. This is going to conclude our webinar, but we ask, don't forget, you can join the conversation about today's webinar on Twitter after the fact using the hashtag ACSM webinar. All right, with that, we'll end our webinar. Thanks again to our presenters. And Have a great weekend, everybody. <laughs> thanks, you too. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye.